was all made possible from um, the donations and the offerings that um, are accepted here. And so if you're not giving to this offering, these are some of the ways that we spread the love of Jesus and help people find Jesus and love God through our mission. And so I just want to encourage you to, to give online if you don't do so yet. And we also have some places out in the lobby where you can do so too. But just when we're all participating in this, it's uh, awesome to be a part of this, this mission together. And if you want to be a part of the Moments of Hope team, uh, we would love for you to just go to velocitychurch.info and sign up. We have a new one. I think coming in July should be a lot, a lot cooler weather that time, you know, but uh, it's just really cool to be a part of a church that has a, has a mission of focused outreach, and that's one of the coolest things that we do. And so glad that you are a part of all that. We couldn't do that without the support and financial backing of all of y'all. So thanks for that. I'm going to go ahead and pray for us. I'm going to pray that God would just really speak to our hearts and illuminate our, our minds of what he wants to say to us. So will you join me in prayer? Uh, Lord God, we just thank you for uh, the moments of hope that you give us, the, the hope that you um, sent through your son Jesus and the, the hope that we have in him by placing our faith in him. Thank you for that wonderful gift, that gift that, um, that we don't deserve. There's nothing we can do to, to earn that or um, improve upon that. Just receiving that gift is, is so wonderful. So thank you again for sending Jesus to this planet to redeem us, to save us. And we pray, God, as we go through this uh, day, as we go through this series, that you would show us uh, where to place that, that confidence in. And you would teach us, you would challenge us, and inspire us. And we ask that in your name. Amen. sermon series today called Be Confident. And we're going to be looking through 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5. Today we're going to be uh, in a big chunk of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles with you or if you have a phone and have a Bible app, uh, we're going to be going through quite a few verses. And so I want to encourage you to open that up and kind of follow along as we go, uh, go through there. Uh, we're going to be talking about the confidence that transcends our circumstances and the things that keep us grounded in times of uncertainty. And so we're going to be talking about characteristics that build our confidence, help us to become confident people over the next few weeks. Now, in these three chapters that we're going to be looking at, the words we know and confident and bold are used repeatedly through, throughout the chapter. And so we're going to be looking at where that comes from and how we establish confidence in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12 is our theme verse for the entire series. And Paul writes, Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Now today we're going to look at what the therefore is therefore, uh, but I do want to highlight that word bold in verse 12 in this text, since that's what our theme comes from, because there are a couple of things that this word refers to. The first thing I'll mention is this. This word bold means free and fearless confidence or cheerful courage or assurance. And I just got to say, when I think of confidence, when I think of boldness, and when I think of assurance, there's one thing that kind of sticks out in my mind, uh, one particular thing that, that we can participate in that really, uh, really exudes confidence in life. And the, so the first thing that I think about when I think about confidence is I think about trash talk. Now, I don't know if, if you're familiar, if, you, if, if you're not familiar with trash talk, uh, trash talk is, is just this timeless pastime, especially in sports, uh, athletics, where you uh, let your opponent know exactly what you think about their abilities and, and your abilities and, and the contrast therein. 
All right, and the NBA finals are, well, not the finals, the conference finals are on right now. And so, I, I, you know, there's a ton of, a ton of opportunities for some great t- trash talk bef- between teams. And I know not everybody's a big basketball fan, but there, there's some really good basketball being played right now. And trash talk has evolved just a little bit throughout the years. I mean, uh, so gone are the days of Larry Bird and Michael Jordan where these guys would just go, I mean, they go up to their opponent and say, this is exactly what I'm about to do to you, all right? So I'm going to dribble left, I'm going to spin, I'm going to lay it in just like right in your face, and that's what's going to happen. Or somebody would try to, every once in a while, you got some young players that would come in the league and they, they thought, oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to show up Michael Jordan. And so they would tr- talk trash to him. And like at the end of the game, you know, he'd be like, oh, I dropped 45 points. Like, what did you do? Nothing. You know, I mean, those kinds of things. That I highly edited that, by, by the way. I mean, trash talk can get pretty vicious. And, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that trash talk is something that we should do, but maybe this is what Paul is, is, is leaning towards. I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. And trash talk has become actually pretty nonverbal now in the NBA, where instead of directly talking to someone and telling them how you feel about who they are um, and, and their abilities, now, now there's just nonverbal communication where there, there's uh, hand gestures that, that you can use. And, and some of you are like, well, hand gestures, whoa, <laughs> what are you, you know, but, but you got the rock the baby, you know, uh, the, the, you, you can do that. There's the, one of my, uh, there are a couple of really good ones, but there's the three arrow, like when you make a three pointer, you, you shoot the arrow, that's good, or the eyeballs, you know, scored right in your face, that's pretty fun. Um, one of my favorites, I think, uh, stirred up, there's the James Harden stirred up, that, that's a pretty good one. Uh, one of my favorites is the too small. And so, you know, somebody can't guard you. They're too, too small to, to, to stop you. And so it's pretty good stuff. So I'm, I'm just trying to give you some ideas during the week. When you're at work, you know, and you're with a client or a customer or a coworker, you know, maybe you need to talk a little trash, uh, build some confidence. As a preacher, I don't get to talk trash all that much. Um, I wish I did. I don't know. There's just not great uh, opportunities to be able to do that, except when I'm at home with a family, you know, and we're playing like foosball or something like that, right? And, uh, and you know, they just... They just can't beat me. Uh, so we, we try to keep that pretty entertaining around the house, and we talk a little trash all in good fun uh, And uh, because everybody loses to me in foosball. Like, that's, it's been really fun uh, for me. Well, like I mentioned, there are a couple things that this word bold refers to, and another one is so it's that cheerful confidence, that free and fearless confidence um, that that word refers to. But the other thing is freedom in speaking or unreservedness in speech. So obviously Paul is saying that because of the hope we have as followers of Jesus, we can talk trash about it. Like that's, that's what he's getting at. Okay, maybe, maybe not. Or did we take that too seriously? I don't, I don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe not. But the common defaults for confidence that we often have in life, that we often observe among other people, uh, leads us to the conclusion that because of much of the time we observe that people who exude confidence either, they don't care what anybody thinks about them, or they're so much better that other, than other people at whatever it is they do, they exude so much self-esteem and self-confidence in and of themselves, they're, they're unshakable in, in those things. And so they seem free and fearless in their confidence, or they're un- or reserved in their speech. You know, they can, they can talk because they, they can walk the walk. And those are the things when we lack self-confidence that most people are hoping for. They see those things like, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to be like that person. I'd like to be, be able to have that kind of confidence where I don't care what anybody thinks about me, and I can do whatever I want because I know I'm good at whatever I, I do. And so we think that maybe some uh, good self-talk or, or being like that will help us enough to help correct an unhealthy low self-esteem. And while there's some value in some of that, there's also a premise that needs to be corrected. And that is that if our confidence is only generated through ourselves, then it is not on a foundation that will last. I can talk as much trash as I want to when I'm playing foosball against the family, but sooner or later, the mind games are not going to work anymore. They're going to figure it out, and they're going to beat me. Now, it's just not going to be anytime soon, so, so don't, don't, uh, don't be too encouraged there, uh, son and daughter. The problem is not that we need more self-confidence. And so I just want to kind of get this out of the way at the beginning of this sermon series. So this is not going to be like, oh, here are the you know, five steps that I need to generate more self-confidence in my life so I can go into my job or go into my relationship or that kind of thing and everything be amazing for me all the time because I have this really healthy self-talk. It's not going to be about that because the problem is that not that we need more self-confidence. What we need is confidence in something that is far greater than ourselves because we're fallible and we can't sustain our own confidence for ourselves. And what we need to be more confident is more confidence in God. Our confidence comes through humbly trusting Christ, 
not ourselves. And that's what we find as we read through 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It teaches us, Paul teaches us to be humble and to put our trust in God. And so we're going to be looking at this section of Scripture through different chunks as we go through so we see how Paul builds this case for how we can be confident, how we're meant to be bold. Therefore, because of the hope that we have, we can be bold in our lives. So we can speak boldly, we can live boldly, we can think boldly, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. And so let's start in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And Paul writes this, Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. So in the first century, when people were traveling around, I mean, you didn't have ID, you didn't have social security cards, you didn't have an Instagram that somebody could follow, you didn't have a Twitter, that kind of thing, a website uh, where people could know who you are because you're already famous, that kind of thing. You had a letter of recommendation, you know, people that let you know, hey, this person is legit. And as Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, I mean, this is not the only letter that he has sent them at this point in his ministry. He has, he has sent them tons of instruction. He's preached to them, and he says, hey... You know, the evidence of my self-worth here among you is not because some other person says I'm amazing or because I wrote my own letter of recommendation and tell you how amazing I am uh, on my LinkedIn profile. Um, he, he, he says it, it, has, it has everything to do with the result of what's happening in your life. And so look around and look at what's happening to you. And, and it's not because of how amazing of an evangelist Paul is and because of how incredible his sermons have been and because of all the ways that he served them, you know, that's created these amazing things and results that they can look at in your life. It's all because they are able to see what God has done through Paul simply being obedient to preaching his word to the people. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4-5, through 5, Paul writes, "...such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God." So Paul's confidence in his competence wasn't relying on other people's endorsement, nor was it in himself. His confidence was in God and what God is doing. That, that is not the message that we normally hear in our everyday life. The world will insist that you can gain confidence if you put enough trust in yourself. And so we hear a lot of things about, you know, hey, we need to build up one another's self-esteem, you need to build up your self-esteem, or you need to build up your kid's self-esteem. Believe in yourself. You can do it. You can cope with anything. You can do anything you put your mind to. You can be anything you want to be, right, kids? Like, that's, that's the one thing we're supposed to teach our kids as parents. Maybe not. I mean, as parents, you want your kids to have a reasonable amount of self-esteem, right? You want them to have a healthy self-image and self-worth. But maybe that's not based on them themselves and who they are and how they feel in the moment. Maybe it's built on something greater than that. Um, If we tell them and we tell other people that you can be anything you want to be if you just believe in it strongly enough and and put enough work and effort into it, then then everything's going to be exactly the way that you want to be. We might not be helping them out very much. Can you imagine another basketball reference? Shaquille O'Neal. For those of you that don't know, he's a big guy. About seven foot two, 350 pounds, all right? It's a big guy. Imagine this, this man and, his, and growing up and, and all the growth spurts that he went through. Imagine his mom telling him, honey, you can be anything you want to be. And Shaquille saying, I want to win the Kentucky Derby as a jockey. <laughs> I mean, what are we doing here? Like, what, what are we saying? Yes, honey, you can, do, you can be anything you want to be. Like, no, that, that's probably not going to... I mean, maybe... Maybe Shaq could throw the horse over his shoulder and run, like, like maybe it could work that way, but that's probably not going to happen. And here's the thing, now, no, matter how, now, no matter how confident um, that we may feel, no matter how much we build our self-esteem, no matter what kind of healthy self-talk that we have, there are going to be some difficult challenges that we cannot resolve on our own, regardless of how much we believe in ourselves. And so when the business fails, when our stock folds, when our health breaks, when our children rebel, when your spouse has an affair... Um, when you have a loss in your family, when, you know, there's a tragedy, there's a horrific thing that happens in our lives, all the self-confidence in the world is not going to be sufficient. And in that moment, your strength 
needs to come from something that's far greater than yourself that can be sustained in you beyond just your own ability in that moment. And the disciple of Jesus can be confident in uncertain times because we put our trust in Jesus and not ourselves for our strength. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Here's this example that Paul writes uh, that really brings this, I think, into clear focus. And this is from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses uh, 16 through 18. And this is Paul is in prison. He's, um, he, he's being accused of um, uh, 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 going against the Roman Empire. And uh, Paul writes this, At my first off- defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them, but... And, and, and some of you maybe have know exactly what this feels like. You feel alone, you feel abandoned, you're in this moment where, like, you, you've got nothing. But, Paul says, the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. In order for us to have this kind of confidence and this kind of boldness to speak out for who God is and what he's doing in our lives, we, we, we need to approach our lives and God's movement in them with humility. And, and that is the thing that's going to get us to a place where we are fully, fully convinced and fully confident in who God is and what he is doing in our life, regardless of the, conf- the, the circumstance that we find ourselves in. We need to come to the place in order to build our confidence where we can admit, God, I can't do this on my own. And, and I need you. And I need to put my trust and my hope and my confidence in you. If you think about it like this, the Christian life has many paradoxes. And I've, I've said this countless times throughout the years. God is not uncomfortable with paradoxes. We are. God is not. We die to live. We give to receive. We lose ourselves to find ourselves. We surrender to experience victory. And we humble ourselves to be exalted. And in order to be confident, we admit our inadequacy. When it, when it comes to life, when it comes to what we face, when it comes to who we are, compared to who God is and what he's willing to do for us in our lives, it takes humility for us to say, God, it's, it's not about me. Like, this is not something I can do on my own. I, I can't handle the stress of the day. I'm not enough for this moment. I need you to be more than what I can be on my own. And when we put our trust in him, he comes alongside of us to reinforce us and to enable us by the gift of his presence continually in our lives through the Holy Spirit. So that we can say with Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because when Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, which is really popular in sports venues, right? Because that's why God gives us strength is so we can make three-pointers uh, and win NBA championships. Um, no, it's because Paul says, hey, here are all the times that I've almost been killed. Here are all the times that I've been jailed. Here are the times that everything has gone horribly for me. Yet despite all that, because of who God is and how he strengthens me, I can do all things. Our confidence comes from relying on God's grace, not our performance, and that takes humility for us to recognize that's what we need. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, Paul writes, He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And when Paul's talking about this, he's talking about the Old Testament law, he's talking about the contrast between that and the new covenant, and we'll talk about a couple more contrasts here in a minute. Um, but we, we might think that as we look at our society, we look at our culture, like we, we, don't, really, we don't really live law-based anymore. Right? We're not following the Old Testament law, but maybe we are following a different type of law and, and expectation that isn't really fulfilling what we need in our lives. Uh, for example, um, most people in the world perceive that when you die, you will be judged by obedience to the law. It's like, well, not necessarily the Old Testament law, but um, if you ask most people, the question, when you die, do you think you'll go to heaven? Most people would say, well, I hope so because I've been a pretty good person. Um, that's that's a, the idea of that, the thinking that the foundation of that kind of thinking is, is law-based. It's like, well, maybe there's this list of my life. And so at the end of, end of the list, there's the good side and there's the bad side. 
And what I'm hoping for, like if there's, if there's 50 things on the list, you know, hopefully I've got 26 good things and 24 bad things, you know, because that, that one extra good thing, I think, that, I think that'll get, get me in. Like that's, that's how things work, right? God is, is up there. He's checking his book. He's checking it twice, trying to find out who's naughty or nice. God is, God is going to judge you someday. I, you know, like th- that idea that, you know, we, as long as our good list is longer than our bad list, we're, we're, we're good. And yet, in the face of that, like, that's kind of our hope. That's the, that's the way we think. And yet, in the face of that, you talk to people how they feel about the prospect of dying and the way that we handle death in our culture is not that great and not that healthy. Um, people live in constant fear of death or judgment or how people are going to think about them or their legacies, all those kinds of things. So like Paul in the Second Timothy passage we just read, Christians can be confident even when we face something as significant as death because we rely on humbly needing God's grace. Second Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Paul writes, Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Paul's referring to some Old Testament things that happen here as he's helping his readers understand the transition from this idea of law-keeping to how God operates through grace and mercy and how the law was not meant to be the final word in our salvation and our redemption back to God that Jesus is and how that works. So let's think about some of the contrast. So when he refers to Moses, by the way, like this is something that you can go back and, and look up. Moses, as he is within the presence of God, it shone on his face. And so he had to, people were kind of freaked out about it because his face was really bright. So he had to cover that. We'll talk about that here in a, in a second. Think about the contrast, though, between the Old Covenant law, and for some of you, maybe this is the first time that you've heard this, but the Old Testament or the Old Covenant law and the New Covenant or the New Testament law of grace and mercy. Old Covenant was received by Moses on Mount Sinai. The New Covenant was delivered by Jesus at the hill on Calvary. The Old Covenant brought a fading glory, one that was not going to last, as Paul mentions. The New Covenant brought not only a glory that lasts, but increases as time goes on. Moses, his face, his, his glory, the, his face shining, it faded with time. The glory of Christ increases in time. The Old Covenant demanded rigid perfection. And yet we say, no perfect people allowed. How, how can this be? Well, it's because the New Covenant is based on trusting in the perfecting worth of Christ. Because he's the one who's perfect for us in our place. The Old Covenant brought condemnation and death. Because nobody could keep it in their own power, the new covenant brings forgiveness and life and righteousness. Forgiveness and life through the blood of Jesus and righteousness through the freedom in the Spirit. The old covenant relied on our works. The new covenant relies on God's grace. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And this is meant to build our confidence. This is meant to give us boldness in who we are because of what God has already done through Jesus. So a response as Christians to, hey, what's going to happen? You know, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? A response is, I think I've piled up enough good things to get in. Like I've got enough chips. I I I I can afford the cost. No, it's because in humility we say, I've I've never been good enough, and I never will be to earn that on my own, but because of who Jesus is, and because of his perfection, and because of him dying in my place, I know I have this boldness, I have this confidence because of what God has done through him, that yeah, I'm, I'll see you there, and we'll be there together, and that's grace, that's mercy, that's what Jesus has done for us. We can't afford to pay it on our own. Jesus has done, done that, being the perfect lamb of God through his blood. And this means we are given the opportunity, the gift, the free gift of God, to trust Jesus as the source of our confidence. And our response is to live lives of gratitude for all that he has done for us. And what that means for us is when we are humble, our confidence comes from our character and not our reputation. 
a lot of times we look, look at other people and we think, man, that, you know, the, the things that they're able to do, things that they're able to accomplish, like how amazing is that? Uh, what is more important to our lives and for our self-confidence and for who God is making us and creating us to be is who we are on the inside rather than who we are and how, rather than who people view us on the outside. Paul uses Moses as the example in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. He says, We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to present, prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. So because Moses was in the presence of God, his face glowed. So initially he put a veil over that because it was so bright and, and kind of freaked people out just, just a little bit. But he kept the veil on because he didn't want people to think that it was going away. Gradually, as Moses realized this glory was fading away, he tried to keep the veil because he, 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 wanted the, he wanted the same reputation, right? He wanted people to think, hey, this is the same incredible person who was in the presence of God. Um, the world finds a lot of fulfillment and teaches us to find a lot of fulfillment based on what people think of us. The way we value things, you know, we, we value the young and the beautiful Uh, We're told that you can be self-assured if you look good, if you make a good impression on people. But the problem with that is, as we as we age, some of us have discovered that more than others, our glory diminishes at some point. And and yet, the older we get, for some of us, we also we our, our confidence doesn't wane because we realize none of those things were that important to begin with, at all. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, Paul says, Their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ it is taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. And as Paul is writing this, he said, you know, the still, same problem still exists. Is that when, when we base our confidence in the ro- r- wrong things, he says, oh, Moses' face glowed. Okay, <laughs> cool. Like, that's what our confidence is in. What about when that fades away? God, God said, that was never, never what you were called to put your confidence in to begin with. So it wasn't that everything in your life is going to be perfect. Everything's going to be hunky-dory. You know, you're not going to have to deal with the consequences of sin in the sin world. It has nothing to do with that. It's that God has taken care of your salvation, gives us his grace, mercy, love, justice, and righteousness. And, and like, that, that is what changes the entire trajectory of our lives for all eternity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, uh, Paul says, Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is t- taken away. So when we humble, our, humble ourselves, turn to, turn to Jesus, accept the, the, him through faith, the veil is taken away, and we see clearly what we were not able to see before. There's a movement from the pride of reputation to the humility of developing character in our life. Finally, in 2 Corinthians three seventeen through 18, Paul says this. Now the Lord is spirit. The Lord is the spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. Regardless of what's happening on the outside, whatever we're looking at in the mirror, whatever we're experiencing in the circumstances of our life, our confidence comes not from all those external, you know, reputational measures. It comes from what God is already doing, has done, and is doing on the inside of our hearts and our minds through Jesus. That's where the transformation comes from. It, it starts when we become disciples of Jesus. When we say yes to Jesus, when we're baptized in him, I mean, that's part of the picture of that. All the old stuff is washed away. All the new stuff, the new creation life, that, that has begun. That's why that imagery is there for us when we say yes to, yes to Jesus. The old things are passed away. All, all, the, all the things in our life become new. And we become confident, not because of what we can produce, but because of what God has given for us. And I'm, I'm just going to assume that there's something in your life this morning that you are not confident about. And I just want to ask you, uh, whatever that thing is this week, is to, is to do the work of taking your own strength out of the equation and instead ask yourself this, am I letting my confidence in who God is directing me to be? In other words, am I focused on being guided by the Spirit in my effort and the character of who I am when I do this thing? Is, is that, or, or is it the result? Is the reputation is what other people see? 
Or regardless of what happens, let, let's, say, let's, let's say you don't get the result that you want. Maybe it's the project that you're doing at work. Maybe it's the thing that you're you know, trying to teach your kid at home. Uh, well, like regardless of what it is, no matter what it is, who was I when I did this thing versus what was the result I got out of it? Was I faithful to who God has enabled me to be? Did, did I humbly put my trust and my hope and my faith in his strength, not knowing what he might do through this versus what I was able to do it through my own strength? Because that's when we find the freedom from the need for self-confidence, because we'll have an endless supply of confidence in God. Rather than how others view us or how we view ourselves, our reputation, how how we can approach this thing in such a way that you know that you've been who God has called you to be and can hold your head up confidently, the character that he calls us into, that's what matters. All of this confidence, boldness, assurance that we lack and yet we know we need, that Paul relies on for strength even while chain, in chains for the gospel, it's not on, built on anything that we've done, but it's built on what God has done. And it is our, is our, it is our pursuit of humility and glorifying God that will build our confidence because we know that he can back up anything that he says. The more we humble ourselves before God, the more confident we become because our strength is in Christ and not in ourselves. Our hope for real life is not on what we can do, but it's in what God has done and what Jesus does in and through us. And our fulfillment is not found in a reputation that will ultimately fade, no matter how good it is, but in a character that deepens with the passing of time as we model our lives after Jesus. So be confident through the humility of recognizing that God is the one who provides the strength that we need through his son Jesus, and he sustains it within us through his Holy Spirit. Let's pray. God, we, we need to be confident. We need to be bold. We need to um, be, be free and fearless in, in who we are. That's something that, that we long for uh, in, our, in our hearts, and it's something that you enable for us to experience in, in a healthy way, in the way that we were designed to. God, help us to be uh, unreserved in our speech when it comes to how we, um, how we place our confidence in you, that um, if any boasting might, might happen, that it will be in who you are and what you've done and the evidence that we see every day in our life of you actively working within us. Help us to take the focus off of ourselves long enough to put it on you to see that and to see you at work. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Every week at Velocity, we take communion together, and uh, we place ourselves on a foundation of being confident in the hope and trust we have because Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and they raised again and continues to be the living sacrifice for us to be redeemed and reconciled to God. Um, Philippians chapter 2 is my favorite chapter in the Bible, and in, in this chapter, uh, Paul says this, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming co obedient to death, even death on a cross. This is a, this is a place where we are, are humbled by the level of humility that Jesus was willing to put in a place so that we could be redeemed. And so as we take communion together this morning, may we be reminded of that, may we, may we meditate on that, and may we consider how that is meant to impact and change how we think about ourselves and our lives each and every day. Let's share in that time together now.
darkness tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Y'all stand and sing with us, please. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the lies. Oh, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name there's power in your name there's power that can break off every chain there's power that can empty out a grave there's resurrection power that can save there's power in your name there's power in your name my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when i stand in your love My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Your love, I'm standing in your love, standing on the rock. I'm standing in your love A refuge for the poor A shelter from the storm this is our God He will wipe away your tears And return your wasted years This is our God So call upon His name He is mighty and saves His heart Father to the orphan, a healer to the broken, this is our God. He brings peace to my madness and comfort in our sadness, this is our God. 
to call upon his name he is mighty to save this is our god this is the one we have waited for this is the one we have waited for this is the one we have waited for jesus lord and savior this is our Come for the thirsty, a lover for the lonely. This is our God. He brings glory to the humble and cries for the faithful. This is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to save us, is our God. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. This is the one we have waited for. You are the one we have waited for. You are the one we have waited for. Jesus, Lord and Savior. This is our This is our God. 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 Hey, thanks for being with us here today. Those of you at home, sorry about the sound. Have a great week. See ya.